Amen. Well, I bring greetings from South Florida, the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. And uh, whenever you hear about all that trouble that's coming out of South Florida, I want you to pray for me, all right? And I know that way you'll, we'll get a lot of prayer down there in South Florida, but it's a joy to be here tonight. Thank you, Pastor Sexton, for the invitation. And we love you. We love Mrs. Sexton. And we love the Temple Baptist Church. This is a special, special honor for me to be able to be in this meeting and to have the opportunity to preach this hour. I love this place. Last night, we came a little bit early, and last night I had my oldest son with me, and we were driving around <clears throat> the properties here a little bit, and I was reminiscing over the years, and it was amazing. I got a little sentimental, and I'm not a real sentimental kind of person, but I got a little sentimental, and thinking about just some of the memories, some of the things that God has done at this place in my life, and what a joy it is. I remember the first time that I ever remember coming onto this property, it was in the late 1980s, and I was just a boy about 11 years old, 12 years old, and our family was on vacation, and my dad, as Pastor Sexton mentioned, was a friend for many, many years of Pastor Sexton, and my dad said to us, he said, uh, we're going to go by the Temple Baptist Church in Powell, Tennessee, my friend, Clarence Sexton, has just recently moved from New Jersey down to Tennessee and is pastoring a church there, and we're going to go by and see him and see his church. And I'll never forget that. We drove, we drove on the property. Of course, it looked much different back in the late 80s, and we stayed pastor in that little apartment over here in the educational building around the corner from where the gymnasium is. It was like a prophet's chamber there, and I believe it was a Saturday we came in, and we were in the room getting settled in, and we heard this voice. And we were trying to figure out where the voice was coming from. And we realized it was the intercom. And it was you, Pastor Sexton. You were saying, hey, are you in there? Are you in there? And uh, he came up from the office and came and saw us. And I met him as just a boy. And uh, he probably doesn't remember this, but he took me around to the gymnasium and showed me how to turn all the lights on in the gymnasium, pulled a rack of uh, basketballs out. And we were able to shoot hoops a little bit and talk. And boy, I thank God for bringing Dr. Clarence Sexton into my life, the influence that he's had on my life. And then over the years as a Bible college student, I was able to come here in 1995 and got a lot of wonderful things here, a lot of wonderful things, but nothing more wonderful than my dear wife, Carolyn. And we met here in the 1990s and God has blessed our, our family with four wonderful children and the joy of serving the Lord. There's just nothing like serving God. And I want to be an encouragement to you tonight. This church has been a great encouragement to me. And I pray tonight that I'll be an encouragement to you as well. Take your Bibles with me. Let's open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 for the text from the scriptures tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll begin reading in just a moment in verse number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writes to a church that he dearly loves, a church that God had used him to start. We read about that wonderful work of God in Thessalonica. We read about that in Acts chapter 17. But as Paul writes back to this local church that he loves so dearly, inspired of the Holy Spirit, he writes in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, beginning of verse number 1, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. For even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... Even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children." So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor 
and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and, and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I want to draw your attention tonight back to the very first verse of chapter 2 where Paul writes and says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. I want to preach tonight on this thought for just a few minutes. It's not in vain. It's not in vain. Would you pray with me tonight? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have this hour to assemble together in this place. And Father, we have prayed diligently for this meeting. I know this church has prayed. Lord, we ask your blessing upon all the services ahead of us this week. Lord, do something great that only you can do. We pray that when it is all said and done, that we would look back at this meeting and know that your hand was upon us and with us and that you have done a work in our hearts that can only be explained by the hand of God. Father, bless this hour, lead and guide me, help me to be a spirit-filled preacher. May you get all the honor and all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The songwriter wrote, We have labored in the vineyard of the Lord, and it seems the world has stolen our reward. But God has not forgotten, and when he calls us home, we'll receive eternal treasures and a place of honor near his throne. It's not in vain. Amen. It's not in vain. We serve a risen Savior. Jesus rules and reigns. The heavens cheer us on. We do not walk alone. Our labor, our witness, our faith is not in vain. The Apostle Paul uses this word vain at the end of verse 1 in our text. I want you to note that word in the scripture tonight. The word vain here means empty. It means meaningless. It means without effect or fruitless. And I'm glad tonight that the Holy Spirit through the Apostle here reminds us that in the work of God, what we do for the Lord and what we do in the Lord is not in vain. It is not empty. It is not meaningless. It is not without effect if it is done in the Lord. It is not in vain. The great cross reference to this verse, I would encourage you to mark it in your Bible tonight and turn to it with me if you will, is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. If you turn your Bibles there with me, this great cross reference gives us additional light to this great truth of the work of God not being in vain. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the same Apostle Paul is writing to another church he loved, the church at Corinth. And I want you to look with me at verse 58, a great verse. If you've not memorized this verse, I would encourage you to mark it and memorize it. Hide it in your heart. But let's read it out loud together. It's a familiar verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, out loud together. You ready? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. What a great verse. That verse shows us that the work of God, the work of the Lord is not in vain. But notice the last little phrase in verse 58 there. It says here that the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We can know tonight with confidence from the word of God that when we labor in the Lord, that labor is not in vain. When we labor for the Lord, when we labor according to God's word, when we labor out of a heart of love for God and for his glory, nothing that is done in the Lord is done in vain. Tonight, this is a vital truth 
a vital truth in the word of God. Because I want to tell you tonight, the devil's a liar. The devil would love to lie to us tonight as God's servants and deceive us. And he would love to get up on our shoulder and tell us that the work that we do in the Lord and the work that we're doing for the Lord is in vain. He would love to deceive God's people tonight and discourage God's people tonight to believe that what we're doing isn't really worth it. All the work we're doing, all the labor we're doing, is it empty? Is it meaningless? And God's word gives a resounding answer. It's not in vain. A few years ago, I was on Facebook one day at home, and Facebook can be wonderful. It can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse. Amen? (laughs) And I was on Facebook, and I saw a young man on Facebook that had grown up in our ministry in Naples when I worked for my dad, and I had spent a lot of time with him. I had done a lot of training and discipleship with him. He was on my bus route. We worked together, went soul winning together, spent hours together, praying, serving, trying to win souls, trying to train him. And unfortunately, he had gotten away from the Lord. He had gone down a a wrong path. He was out of church. He had joined the military. He was going the wrong way. And I came across his Facebook page, and I saw that, and I saw the way he was living, I knew it wasn't honoring the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, I got a little bit discouraged. I was looking at that and I thought, look at that. All those hours, all that time I spent teaching him the Bible, training him, trying to pour my life into him. And look at this. As I was sitting there complaining, my dear wife came by. How many of you are thankful for a godly wife? Amen. <laughs> and she said, what's wrong? I said, look at this. Look how he's living. After all the things we taught him, look how he's living. And she said, she said, Tommy, pray for him. (laughs) And by the way, she said, look at all the ones that are living for God. And by the way, don't we do it for the Lord anyway? Don't you hate it when your wife is right? (laughs) Thank God for a good wife. She was right. She encouraged me that day. She reminded me that if a work is done in the Lord, it, listen, we don't have to worry about results. All we got to worry about is pleasing God because the labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain. What you're doing for God tonight, dear friend, is not in vain. I want every bus worker, every Sunday school teacher, every soul winner, every Christian parent to be encouraged tonight. If what you're doing is in the Lord and it's for the Lord, keep on keeping on for God. It's not in vain. You go back with me to our text in 1 Thessalonians. We look at this passage and Paul says that his entrance into them was not in vain. I want to encourage you with a few thoughts tonight of things that are not in vain in the Lord. Paul writing to them says in verse 1, Know ye for yourselves, brother, know our entrance in unto you. He's thinking back to when he came on his missionary journey to that city of Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. And he's saying that what happened on that entrance, what happened on that journey, what happened in that city was not in vain. And I want to encourage you tonight, number one, our prayers are not in vain in the Lord. Prayer is not in vain in the Lord. This missionary journey was started Paul's missionary journeys were started out of the great church at Antioch. We read about that in Acts chapter 13. And Acts 13, 3 tells us when they were getting ready to send Paul and Barnabas and the team. The Bible says in Acts 13, 3, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. The work that was done in Thessalonica was a work that had been bathed in prayer. I can imagine in my mind's eye going back to that that church at Antioch when they sent those missionaries out on that first missionary journey. What a meeting that must have been as they laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and they prayed. I can imagine how they prayed. Oh God, use these men to take the gospel to the regions beyond as you've commanded us to do. That faithful church in Antioch prayed. They prayed as Paul and the others traveled and went from city to city. And I want to tell you tonight, dear friend, everything that was accomplished by those missionaries was accomplished as it started in prayer. Everything must start with God. I believe tonight that we serve a God who hears and answers prayer. Amen. Hebrews 11:6. but without faith it is impossible to please him. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God hears and answers prayer. And when a church prays in the Lord, that's not in vain. We will see God's work as we pray. I mentioned just a few minutes ago about that young man that got away from God. And we did pray for him. Our church prayed for him. We, uh, we, we have done those 24-hour prayer vigils. I learned how to do that here when I was a college student. I remember when I first got to my church as pastor, I announced we were going to do a 24-hour prayer vigil. And I didn't, I didn't make myself clear. This is about 10 years ago. I was a young pastor. And uh, you got you to get the picture. We had 18 people our first Sunday morning. Sunday night, 12. The first Wednesday night, we had seven. Amen. When I said we're going to have a 24-hour prayer vigil, they all thought we are all going to pray 24 hours straight. (laughs) And then I had to clarify, you know, we're all going to sign up for an hour and so on. And then then I said this. I said, look, I said, whatever hours aren't signed up for, I'm going to come pray. Well, you do the math. We didn't have 24 people in the church at the time. I prayed a lot. Of, I got so close to God that first prayer vigil. It was wonderful. Amen. <laughs> now, praise God, we have hundreds of people that help us in prayer. Why? Because God hears and answers prayer. We prayed for that young man. A few months later, my cell phone rang beside my bed at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, whenever a pastor's phone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning, you usually think, you wake up and you, you try to figure out who you are, where you are, what's going on, Right? You think somebody's died, somebody's in a hospital, and my phone's ringing, and I'm trying to figure out if I'm dreaming or if I'm awake, and I look over, and I look at my phone, and it's the name of that young man, that very young man that I was discouraged about a few months earlier. I answer the phone. I said, hello. He said, Brother Tom. He's crying. Brother Tom, is that you? I said, yes, it's me. Are you okay? What's going on? He said, oh, he said, I got to talk to you. I, I need you to pray with me. He said, a couple hours ago, I was out with some of my friends. He was in the military. He said, I've been living wrong. He said, I've been off in sin. And he said, I, I went out tonight and I was going to cross a line that I never thought I would cross. I was going to cross a line that I may have never come back from. And he said, as I was going into a place I should not have gone, he said, it felt like the Holy Spirit grabbed my arm. Stop me. And he said, I began to shake. And he said, I I ran all the way back to the base. And he said, I got on my my knees beside my bed and I I asked God to forgive me and cleanse me. And he said, Brother Tom, I want you to know I got right with God tonight and I need you to pray for me. I looked over at Carolyn. She said, I told you. (laughs) How can you explain that? I'll tell you how you explain it. There's a God who hears and answers prayer. That young man married a godly Christian woman. They're married now. They have four beautiful children. They're serving God in a local church. Praise God. God still hears and answers prayer. Keep praying, dear friend. Prayer is not in vain. It is not in vain. The apostle Paul said it was not in vain. Number two, not only is our prayer not in vain, our persistence is not in vain. God, give us a revival of Holy Ghost persistence again. So many of God's people giving up, giving in, turning back. May we persist for God. Look at verse number two of our text in 1 Thessalonians 2.2. Paul reminds them that the work of bringing the gospel to them was not without contention. It was not without struggle. Verse 2 But even after that, we had suffered before. Sometimes God calls us to suffering. Sometimes the way of serving God is not always going to be easy. He said, we suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. And he goes on and he says, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Paul remembers and he recalls that 
The devil sought to stop them at every turn. The devil fought them that the struggle was real to get to Thessalonica, but he remembers and he recalls that they did not quit. And I want to say, I thank God that Paul did not quit. He did not give up when things were tough. He did not give up when the battle was real. He gets to Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. But if you go back to Acts chapter 14, you find that Paul is in Lystra and he's stoned there. And I believe he was stoned to death. And I'll tell you, for a lot of Christians, and probably including me, if I got stoned like that, that might have been the end of my missionary journey. But not Paul. The Bible says the disciples are standing around uh, looking at him like he had died, and I think he did die. He rises up, brushes himself off, and gets back to the work for God. Amen. Persistence. In chapter 14, he didn't quit when he was stoned in chapter 15 of Acts. There was infighting among the team and there were disagreements, but Paul kept on keeping on. He didn't quit. He persisted on. In Acts 16, we find when they come to Philippi, as he mentioned in our text tonight, they were publicly shamed, they were beaten, they were thrown into the innermost prison. But yet Paul and Silas and the others did not quit. His persistence was not in vain. And I want to encourage you tonight, if you've had thoughts of giving up or giving in or quitting on what God has called you to do, get back up in the power of God and the strength of the Lord and keep on keeping on for God. The battle is real, but the, the victory is also real. The work is too great. The Lord's name must be lifted up. May we never, never quit. Persistence. Pastors tonight, church leaders, parents, Sunday school teachers, soul winners, we must not quit on what God has given us to do. Down in my area of the country, we're kind of famous for uh, having alligators. If you ever come down to South Florida, maybe you've, uh, you've seen that. It's not a rare thing for us to see alligators, not even far from, from the church and so on. If there's a body of water in South Florida, don't swim in it. There could be an alligator. The other day I saw on the news there was an alligator in a swimming pool. Did you see that? That happened down where I live, of course. But there's a story in the news years ago. A, a boy in South Florida jumped into the, the pond behind the house. Jumped off the dock and began to swim. About the time he hit the water, his mother, looking out the window of the kitchen, saw a figure in the water out in the middle. A very familiar figure, an alligator. That alligator began to swim toward that, that boy. She began to run outside and she yelled his name and she says, come back, come back. And he turned, he saw what was going on. He turned to come back and he was swimming toward the dock and she had run out to the dock. And just as she went to grab his hand, that alligator got a hold of his leg. And a tug of war began back and forth between a hungry alligator and a loving mother. What a tug of war. As she was screaming and yelling, a farmer nearby came with a shotgun and shot the alligator, and the boy survived. He's in the hospital for several weeks with his wounds, and the news reporter came, and they were interviewing him, and they asked him about the, uh, the encounter and the experience, and he was telling them about it, and the news reporter said, would you mind, would you let us see your, your scars, your wounds? And he said, sure, that's fine. And he rolled up his pant leg and he showed where the alligator had bitten his leg and the marks from that alligator's teeth. And he said, but wait a minute. He said, I want to show you some other marks. I'm more proud of these marks. And he rolled his sleeves up and he said, I love these marks. He says, look, th these are the marks from my mother's fingernails. Because she wouldn't let me go. And I want to tell you tonight, dear mothers and dear fathers and Sunday school teachers and bus workers and soul winners, God has given us a work to do and may we not let go of it. The devil wants to take away what God has done in your life and in my life. He wants to devour it, but don't let go in the power of God. Our persistence tonight is not in vain. Our prayers are not in vain. Number three, our principles are not in vain. You go back to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. As Paul writes in verses 2 through 12, we find that he had a principled ministry. We need that today. A principled ministry. The apostle Paul did not have a pragmatic ministry. He had a principled ministry. 
The ends do not justify the means for Paul. You see, Paul did God's work God's way. And I want to encourage you tonight, church member, pastor, Christian leader, whoever you may be tonight, determined to do God's work God's way. It is not God's work our way. It is certainly is not to be God's work the world's way, even though that seems to be creeping into a lot of churches today. May God help us to do God's work God's way. His ministry was a principled ministry. In verse number two, just quickly tonight, we find that Paul had a bold ministry. In verses three through six, he had a, he had a genuine ministry. He was doing it out of the right motives. In verse 7, we find that Paul had a gentle ministry. I love the fact that in verse 2, he speaks of boldness. And in verse 7, he speaks of gentleness. There is, a, there is a godly balance there. There is a fulfillment, a completeness. Christ was full of grace and truth. May God help us tonight to be full of boldness, yet gentle with people. In verses 8 and 9, we find Paul had a devoted ministry. In verse 10, he had a holy ministry. In verses 11 and 12, he had a compassionate ministry. And thank God in verse 13, he had a scriptural ministry. We must examine our lives, examine our labors, examine our ministries and be sure that they are principled, that they are obedient to the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Our principles tonight are not in vain. And then lastly, thank God our preaching is not in vain. Our preaching is not in vain. If you look back in chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul writes, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. I love this verse. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Listen, when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice that word effectually. The word effectually means that which brings results, that which is full, that which accomplishes the desired result. And I want to tell you tonight, that verse reminds us that it is the word of God that is truth. And what our world needs tonight is it needs the truth of God's word. We live in a world that is full of error. We live in a world that is full of darkness. And what it needs is the truth of God's word and the light of God's word. And God's word changes lives. It is effectual to the changing of lives. Now listen, you may not need that tonight, but I need that. I pastor a church down there where all the trouble happens, amen? <laughs> I need that truth. I hold that truth because I know when I look at the community around my church, I know there is no hope apart from the blessed, powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. On Valentine's Day this year, you heard the news about the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. That shooting took place just north of my church. We have people in our church that had family members that were killed in the shooting. The assistant football coach that was also a security guard that jumped in front of the bullets, his wife's grandparents are members of my church. We had friends of our church members that died or were injured or affected by that shooting. That event thrust my community into the national spotlight. Unfortunately, it also put a spotlight on some of the liberalism and godlessness of South Florida. And I know that's everywhere, but boy, it's in abundance where I live. But I'm glad to tell you tonight that in the midst of all the godlessness and all the paganism and all the false beliefs, I'm glad to tell you tonight the gospel still works. The word of God still has power. Lives are still changed by the power of God. Oh, I wish I could tell you tonight story after story after story of what God has done in people's lives. God is moving. We had a man come to our church just a little while back. He came for a Sunday morning service and at the invitation time right over here, he walked down the aisle and one of our assistant pastors led him to Christ. We greeted him and talked to him after the service and when I was speaking to him, he said, he said, Pastor Odom, do you remember me? 
and I, I did not remember him at the moment. I said, remind me when we met. He said, five years ago, or about five years ago, you and your son knocked on my door right over here in a, in a neighborhood in Hollywood, Florida. He said, you knocked on my door and you gave me a gospel track and you witnessed and you invited me to church. He said, and I told you that I would come. He's, the church, he's a big guy. He played offensive lineman for the Miami Hurricanes when he was younger. He was gonna probably make the NFL, but he blew his knee out. And when he said that, I remembered it. The Holy Spirit helped me remember it. And I said, I'm so glad you came today. He said, you know, I threw that gospel track in a drawer and it sat there for over five years. And some things in my life have changed, some things, some circumstances changed. He said, I knew my last hope was to turn to God and I went and I found that track and I came to church today and I trusted Christ as my savior. Hey, God is still saving sinners. It's not in vain when we preach the word of God. Keep preaching. Listen, God is blessing. Our church is seeing people saved from all these different cultures, all these different nationalities, all these different backgrounds and social, social ethnic backgrounds. We have, we, God has blessed us. We, we're having gypsy people saved in South Florida. Amen. We had 60 people in our gypsy service last Sunday. Praise God. Our Roman ministry. We have a man that leads that ministry in our church. I get to go and, and we have a special service for them on Thursday night and uh, I go there and I preach to them and they love the Lord. Listen, you've never been in a testimony service until you've been in a gypsy testimony service. Praise God. I mean, the other day, one of our men in that ministry got up and he was testifying and he said, I want everybody to know my wife and I have been saved. We've dedicated our life to the Lord and we've given up fortune telling. Amen. Praise God. The gospel still works, amen. Hey, it's not in vain. The preaching of God's word is not in vain. Thank God, he still works. The gospel works. Keep on preaching the word of God. Keep on witnessing. It's not in vain. Now tonight, in conclusion, I ask you this. If we know as Christians, as Bible-believing people, if we know that these things are not in vain, why do so many of us give our hearts and lives to so many things that are vain? Why do the vain things of this world charm us so much? May God help us tonight to turn away from the vain things of this world and give our lives to that which is not in vain, that which lasts for time and eternity. May God help us. Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer, wrote over 750 hymns lived in the 17th century, wrote that great hymn, his most famous hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Listen to the second stanza. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. Listen, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Folks, tonight I believe Jesus is coming back soon. I believe that our opportunity is, get, is getting smaller and smaller. I believe the window of opportunity for serving God is coming to a close and it's not too long. Where are God's people who will say, I will turn away from vain things and give my life and give my energy and give my heart to those things that truly matter? It is not in vain. Our prayers, our persistence, our principles, and our preaching. May God help us tonight. May we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight that we know from your word that when we labor in the Lord, our labors are not in vain. Lord God, I pray you'll encourage the heart of Christians tonight. Lord, may our hearts be attentive to your spirit. May we give our lives to those things that are not in vain. May we run the race well set before us in Jesus' name.